Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Prime News. We somehow made it three days in a row. Can you believe it? Three straight days of Nintendo news. Goodness, I can't believe we actually got to this point. No, seriously. We go like three months without any Prime News episodes. Now we're at three days in a row. I do want to kind of make this semi-consistent. You're seeing that I'm releasing this around 11 a.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, noon Eastern, uh, so far each day. I don't know. I don't, let, does this time slot work for you? Are you guys even enjoying these episodes? No cringe today, I don't think. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, I hope you guys enjoy the news. We got lots of good stuff for you from uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 releasing to Joy-Con Drift. Uh, lawsuits and uh, new trademarks and all this crazy stuff happening with Nintendo. So uh, let's just hop right into that news. So first off, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 has launched today. Right now, you can go to the store and buy this game, get it on the eShop, whatever. On Metacritic, at the time of recording, it has a 74. On OpenCritic, it has a 76. Now, compared to the original release of Marvel Ultimate Alliance, way back in the day on like PlayStation 2, Vita, all this stuff, that game actually got an 80. One. Now, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 is actually a little bit lower than Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, so by and large, reviewers are basically saying Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 is better just by a little bit than Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Now, most of them have basically concluded that it's a really fun game, especially playing with multiple people. There's not really any other game on the market quite like it right now, so everyone's essentially saying it's a great game. The problem, though, is that there are some technical issues with the game. Uh, that are hard to overlook at times, really having to do with the frame rate more than anything else. Uh, the resolution itself is dynamic, however, in docked mode it goes from 1080p to 900p down to 720p, so it always stays in HD in docked mode. And even in portable mode, it only goes from 720p down to 540p, which to me I find to be a pretty acceptable resolution dip. But the issue isn't the resolution changes, although you'll be able to notice some blurriness here and there, it's really the frame rate. The game game targets 30 FPS in both docked and handheld mode and struggles to try to hit that target. There are many times it is in the low 20s. I think there was one instance at Digital Foundry where they showed it actually getting to the teens, although this was in handheld mode. Uh, it's a little bit disappointing. Now, I did play this game for myself at E3, and I actually had a really good time. And Digital Foundry even says it's still a lot of fun in spite of these issues. It's just extremely disappointing because Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 is a Nintendo Switch exclusive game. So there's no real reason for them not to better optimize it to run better on Switch. Now, it is made by Team Ninja, and the one caveat about saying, hey, this game's made by Team Ninja, it's not that they don't make high quality games, but they are known to have frame rate issues. All of their Dynasty Warrior games, from Hyrule Warriors and Fire Emblem Warriors to One Piece and, and uh, everything in between actual Dynasty Warriors franchise, have always had frame rate issues on every platform they've ever made games for. So the thing is, this actually falls in line with what happens with these kind of games typically. I just wish it wasn't typical. Uh, that being said, it still sounds like it's a pretty good game. A lot of uh, gamers and fans are actually rating it a lot higher. User scores are coming in the high 70s to low 80s. So fans seem to be enjoying it. Obviously, if you, you love Marvel, you should probably check it out. Uh, I know this is going to be one of the overlooked games here in 2019. This, I think Damon X Machina is a candidate to be overlooked. I don't actually think Astral Chain is going to get as overlooked as some people might presume for it being a Platinum game because Platinum games are often overlooked. But it's the only major release really in August. So I do think it's actually going to get its time in the sun and decent um, advertising heading into that launch once we get past Fire Emblem next week. That's right, one week from today, Fire Emblem Three Houses is here. So that'll be fun uh, checking out the reviews for that a week from now. But still, uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 at least looks like a quality experience. And if you're into beat em up games, if you're into four player couch co op or any of that, uh, this definitely looks like a fun experience particularly if you love the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or just Marvel in general, I guess. It's not really part of the Cinematic Universe. So, Yesterday, I did a live stream about this, but I want to bring it to your attention again. Joy-Con Drift is having a potential class action lawsuit filed against it by CSK and D 
LLC. They are a law firm. Right now, they are just gathering information to decide if they want to push forward with a class action lawsuit against Nintendo. And this is a US based thing, so it would be against Nintendo of America. Uh, the idea here is if you're having Joy-Con drift issues, they want you to go and fill out this form and give them a bunch of details about your issues when you bought your Switch, when the issues cropped up, blah, 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 how bad it is, all that stuff. They want to gather as much information they can and as much people as they can to see if it's worth filing a class action lawsuit against Nintendo. Now, that does not mean that if this lawsuit happens, it would ever go to actual court. But it does mean that if the lawsuit is filed, Nintendo would have to issue an official response. Now, Nintendo may have already fixed Joy-Con Drift. We're just presuming. We don't have any evidence to state this. But with the Nintendo Switch Lite coming out with non-detachable Joy-Cons, a Switch revision landing as well next month, and new Joy-Con colors coming out for the first time in quite a while. It feels like we haven't had new colors at all in 2019. Uh, in October, it's possible Nintendo has already fixed the hardware design flaw that exists in the joystick to actually take care of Joy-Con drift. The problem being that Nintendo has not acknowledged that and we have no evidence yet to prove it. Spawn Wave and others will be doing teardowns, complete teardowns of the Switch Lite, the new revised Switch, and those Joy-Cons as they come out. So we should know within a month or two whether or not Nintendo has already addressed and fixed the problem. But that doesn't do anything for all the old Switch hardware that's been out there now for about two and a half years. Nintendo obviously has not publicly acknowledged this issue in the same way they publicly acknowledged the issue with the left Joy-Con having connection issues at launch of Switch, they quickly addressed and fixed that on the hardware level and issued a public, hey, send your, send your Joy-Con in and we'll fix it for free. So Nintendo would, you know, it'd be nice for some of us to see this from Nintendo. We have spent a lot of extra money on Joy-Cons, not just here at Nintendo Prime, but all of us like out there. I did polls on this on both our YouTube channel and on Twitter, and over 60% of our audience actually has Joy-Con drift issues of varying degrees of from severe to just minor. doesn't matter. A large chunk of people than, I, I think a larger chunk of people than even Nintendo realizes are having these Joy-Con drift issues and we're just kind of dealing with it because we love everything else about the platform. We love the games. We love the switching ability from TV mode to handheld mode to, to tabletop. Like we love so much about the Switch that it kind of gets brushed under the table at times uh, as an issue, a design flaw that we just deal with that we really shouldn't have to deal with. So uh, if nothing else, this class action uh, lawsuit, if it goes through, is at least going to get the, the attention of Nintendo and uh, force them to issue some sort of response. I would like to see them at least acknowledge the issue and that they fixed it or that they're aware that it even exists. Uh, I'm sure Nintendo employees have probably, you know, when you're looking at 60% of my audience, I'm sure there's got to be Nintendo employees that have had Nintendo Drift, you know, Joy-Con Drift issues anyways. So it, it's one of those things that, I don't know what's going to happen. Class action lawsuits happen all the time. Uh, one that affected me personally was DeVry University actually had a class action lawsuit filed against it for false advertising, and it was correct. And because I was attending DeVry during all that, I actually got a check in the mail for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and I think that is something that could happen here if Nintendo does lose the lawsuit. It could be like a, a $40 refund per person who signs up for the class action lawsuit. You know, hey, that left Joy-Con or right Joy-Con or, you know, maybe it's an $80 refund, you know, because that's how much those Joy-Cons are worth at MSRP. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens, if anything. All I know is Nintendo, you need to address this issue. Kotaku brought light to it. Us YouTubers have been bringing light to it forever. Social media has been blowing up over Joy-Con Drift for two years. Uh, Nintendo needs to address this. I'm surprised they haven't. They were so quick to respond to the left Joy-Con connectivity issues. I don't know why they're not quick to respond to another hardware design fault in those Joy-Cons. Really affects the left one more than the right, but that's just because we use the left joystick to move more. The, the flaw exists in both. And I understand some of you out there have never experienced this issue. And if you're a potential Switch buyer, I understand being concerned and maybe having pause. Again, this is why Nintendo needs to address it. So if nothing else, I hope this lawsuit draws attention to that. The June MPD is in, and whoo boy, Nintendo Switch is dominating. Uh, not really surprising, Mario Maker 2 released last month. It is the number one selling game, and it does not even include digital sales. And those physical sales outpaced and outsold the launch sales of Super Mario Maker on Wii U and the launch sales of Super Mario Maker on 3DS, which had a much bigger install base. Essentially, Super Mario Maker 2 is the biggest launch in franchise history. I mean, there's only two games with three launches, but whatever. It is the best, which isn't surprising. That seems to be a trend. Splatoon 2 had a better launch and sold best on Switch in comparison to Splatoon 1 on 
uh, on Wii U. It's just a trend. Breath of the Wild, best-selling Zelda game of all time. Super Mario Odyssey, on its path, if not already, the best-selling 3D Mario game of all time, etc., etc. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe crushed it compared to Mario Kart 8 on Wii U. This is just a trend. Games seem to sell best from Nintendo on Switch in comparison to prior generations of hardware. Uh, what's also interesting, however, is that the Switch was the number one selling hardware and showed massive year-on-year -year growth, while Xbox and PlayStation 4 show massive year-on-year -year decline, Xbox in particular showing massive decline. Not really shocking considering PlayStation 5 and Xbox Scarlet are both announced at this point, and everyone's just kind of waiting to next year to pick a system up, because now it's like, well, you know, maybe we'll pick one up because we want to play Death Stranding, but then after that, it's like, eh, we can wait. Like, Gears 5 do we really need to get an Xbox right now for Gears 5 or can we just wait for the next Xbox which is likely going to be fully backwards compatible and then those games will also be cheaper plus you can get Game Pass. The point is that Nintendo is dominating in this MPD. In fact, 7 of the top 9 games in June's MPD report are on Nintendo Switch. Not exclusively, always. Smash Bros. is on there as an exclusive title, as an example as well, at number 6. Uh, but things like Mortal Kombat 11, that's on both. Crash Team Racing, and what's interesting about Crash Team Racing is it is the best launch of a Crash game. Not just Crash Team Racing, of a Crash game. Crash Bandicoot, whatever. The best launch in the entire franchise's history. And lo and behold, that happens when Crash is on Switch. Pretty interesting, huh? Now, that doesn't mean the Switch version sold best, but, you know, it, it did sell well. We actually have, like, numbers of players online, and while PlayStation 4 is number one, Xbox has about 240,000 play people playing online, when Switch has 170,000, which is respectable in comparison to the numbers the other platforms are doing, considering that those other platforms probably still have a slightly bigger to major install base advantage. So, uh, Crash Team Racing sold well on Switch. I think that's the big takeaway for that. Uh, and that helped make it one of the best, or actually made it the best launch of a Crash game ever. So, I don't know. This is kind of cool. Uh, in general, all the data this year's favorite Nintendo. Nintendo's won the MPD every single month, uh, and it doesn't look like there's a chance of them losing it for the rest of this year. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Call of Duty Modern Warfare or any other major third-party game Nintendo's not getting, or Death Stranding maybe in those months, could potentially hurt Nintendo sales, but then Nintendo's already countering that with Astral Chain, Link's Awakening, new Switch revisions in the light that are probably going to blow up on day one. Uh, you can't forget about Luigi's Mansion, uh, Pokemon, I mean, that's always a system seller. Nintendo is really set up to just dominate this entire year. Isn't surprising. We are in the midst of Nintendo Switch's third year on the market, whereas PlayStation 4, Xbox One, they're in like the fifth, sixth, heading in the seventh. Like it, They've been on the market for quite some time, uh, and now they have their next-gen systems announced, whereas Nintendo's like, hey, look, we announced our new revisions and stuff. We're kind of done talking now. So, uh yeah, take that for what you will. Switch is dominating, uh, and we'll see. We'll see what happens moving forward. Dr. Mario World is Nintendo's latest release on mobile devices, and now we have its first week of data according to Sensor Tower, who is one of the most reliable outlets for examining mobile data. And it looks like Dr. Mario World has about 5 million installs across all devices. Uh, that's very good because in the first three days it only had 2 million, so that means over the next four it gained an additional three. So it is showing, you know, basically sustained growth over that first week, which is great. They also made $500,000 in revenue. Uh, this is obviously an estimation over that first week. Uh, and you might say, well, th that sounds great, but what does that compare to Nintendo's other games? Well, the install base is massively lower in the first week compared to Fire Emblem Heroes, uh, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, and Super Mario Run, but it does crush Dragalia Lost, which isn't really a shocker since Dr. Mario is a more established brand, but not really as big as like a Super Mario kind of game or an Animal Crossing game, right? We haven't had a true Dr. Mario game in a long time, and I'd hesitate to say this is a true Dr. Mario game. Uh, it plays a lot more like the Candy Crushes of the world than it does like Dr. Mario, which was more like a Tetris style game, uh, but whatever. Uh, it's it, it's okay. It's decently fun. Uh, that five hundred thousand dollars in revenue isn't shocking because this game basically works exactly like Candy Crush and other games. It is the most mobile of mobile games Nintendo has made to date. That being said, uh, it does do well in its own genre of being a puzzle game because Toon Blast, by the way, which is a really popular puzzle game of a similar type. Uh, that made over $300 million last year, and when it launched, it only made $90,000 in its first week with a smaller install base. Uh, the you know Candy Crush, you know Friends Saga one, which was like a sequel to Candy Crush, that one made six hundred and seventy thousand dollars in its first week, but it had a much bigger install base because it already had a pre-established base from the original Candy Crush. So. 
This is actually sitting pretty for Nintendo and might have the best revenue potential of every game they've released because it likely is going to consistently get at least two to three million new installs per week for quite some time. And as long as people are sticking by it like they do other puzzle games, there's a potential here for Nintendo with Dr. Mario World to be a massive hundred, multiple hundred million dollar um, revenue getter for them for years to come. So uh, we can doubt Nintendo and not like the direction they did with this game. This isn't the Dr. Mario game for me, even though I've already spent some time playing it. But I get it. Nintendo would be foolish not to tap into that market. Dr. Mario is an IP they don't really even use anymore. Uh, I know there's a Dr. Mario costume in Smash, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I think that this is really cool. And uh, good for Nintendo. I like to see them get these additional revenue um, drivers that don't impact their big sellers on Switch, right? Like, I don't have a problem with them taking advantage of how the mobile market works while they still produce high-quality games that aren't nickel and diming us on Switch. So uh, Nintendo's kind of doing something we don't see a lot of companies do, and that is dance that line. They're giving you, they're giving into the way that mobile games work, but they're also keeping to their guns with their console games. I wish other companies would take this cue and not try to force mobile tactics into full $60 products. Nintendo, thank you so much. I understand why you had to do it. I understand that you don't do it with your Switch games, and I appreciate it. So this is an interesting story. Nintendo teamed with Southwest Airlines to give everyone who flew to San Diego a free Nintendo Switch. They also gave him a free copy of Mario Maker 2. It basically was called an Oprah moment, and half of the plane were cheering when it happened, the other half was in disbelief. Oh, they're not actually giving us a free Switch, but Mario Maker, they're trolling us. But like, the flight attendants were so excited to announce it on the flight. It was when you landed in San Diego, so unfortunately you didn't get it before uh, the trip because, you know, whatever, I guess it was just uh, a thing they were giving out in San Diego. And uh, it was given to everyone, regardless of what you were coming to San Diego for. But the interesting thing is it was actually a Comic-Con promotion Nintendo was doing. So it's really because Comic-Con's happening in San Diego that they that they did this. It's really neat. These are not the Switch revisions, by the way. These were like the OG Switches uh, and, and Mario Maker. Didn't look like they included an online subscription with that Mario Maker copy, but still really, really cool. Good on Nintendo, good on Southwest Airlines. They all partnered up for that. I think it's just really neat. It's a nice surprise. You know, you don't expect anything. You land on a plane and all of a sudden say, hey, by the way, you're getting a Switch. Hey, that's pretty cool. Um, you might have to ship it back to your house if you were just visiting, though, because sometimes you're not going to fit all that stuff in your luggage, depending on how much room you gave yourself. Nintendo has filed a new trademark in Israel, of all places, called the Nintendo Switch Do. Nintendo Switch Do. I'm not sure how they're pronouncing it. It is just D-O, which in English, I mean, it's Do. I... Yeah, uh, whatever. Nintendo can pronounce it however they want. And the actual filing for it is very generic. It just basically includes all video game devices, all video game software. It doesn't really tell you anything about what this trademark means. And just because Nintendo filed this trademark in Israel, which could end up coming to other places, doesn't mean it's actually going to be anything. Some people are thinking it might be um, a new game online subscription service or a streaming service or something, which it could be. But it could also end up being nothing. Nintendo, like many other companies, files a lot of trademarks. They file a lot of uh, patents that they end up never using. So uh, right now, nobody knows what this Nintendo, Nintendo Switch do thing means, if it means anything at all. Uh, I don't have any ideas beyond what I already stated. So maybe you guys have a, some sort of semblance of a concept for what Nintendo Switch do could be or may be. Uh, right now, it's just an interesting patent they've filed and it is particular to Switch. And it's, so when you have a particular patent like that for Switch, or not really a patent, a trademark for Switch, you gotta start wondering, hey, what are they thinking? What are they planning? Are they extending, you know, what, what is the Nintendo Switch do? Is it, is it another Switch revision for crying out loud? Uh, so I don't know. It's one of those things. I just want to throw it out there, get your guys' thoughts on it. Uh, very interesting. I don't, you know, I, I've seen other channels give some theories and stuff, but there's really no real information on this. It's just a very generic trademark. So I don't know. You guys let me know what you think about it down in the comments below. The producer of Dragon Quest XI-S Definitive Edition, what a mouthful, uh, has come out on Twitter to say, hey, the game's done. They're done with it. It's gone gold. We're over. It's cool. The game's ready to go. 
in Japan. <laughs> uh, they did say they're still actually working on the Western localization of it, which isn't surprising. Lots of dialogue and voice acting and all these things to kind of take care of. Uh, but the game's done. They're done, done actually development. It is not an active development anymore. The game's ready to go on Switch. It does release on September 27th, so that's another major game coming out in September, a week after Link's Awakening, by the way, a couple weeks after Damon X Machina. So, uh, yeah, September's looking really jam-packed. And I know it's a game from, like, over a year ago, but you can't help but be a little excited for this one. It's got the classic 2D top-down mode that you can switch the entire game into. I've never seen a JRPG where you could play in that classic style or just go full-blown 3D action RPG. I've never seen a game do this before. I think that's crazy that they're enabling Dragon Quest XI to do that on Switch. Also, there's all that additional content they've added in. When they say Definitive Edition, they mean it. They went all out. And I actually kind of feel bad for people who might have bought it on PlayStation 4 and stuff last year back in July of 2018 because this is just such a much bigger, better version of that game uh, that it feels like you almost got gypped a little bit. Uh, but then again, you got to play the game over a year before we got it on the Switch. So I don't know. I guess that's the trade-off there. Uh, it's interesting they're putting all this attention into the Switch version of the game. But uh, I'm pretty excited about it. They obviously think it's going to be a big seller on Switch. And I think it's got a lot of potential. Dragon Quest Builders 1 and 2 seem to be selling extremely well on Switch. So there's obviously a big Dragon Quest audience. Not really a surprise. Dragon Quest kind of came up on Nintendo platforms back in the day. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens with the sales for this game. I'll put a link down in the description, by the way, if you'd like to pre-order a copy of that game. Use our affiliate link. Give me a small kickback. Uh, it looks exciting. I'm pretty stoked that Dragon Quest XI is a thing on Switch. Uh, and, hey, it's another like open-world RPG kind of game. Um, pair that with The Witcher, and you might not need to play anything else the rest of the year. I say that when there's all these other great games coming out. I don't know how anyone's going to find the time to play all the amazing games coming to Switch the rest of this year. Uh, man. I mean, Fire Emblem alone in a week is like going to be like 300 plus hours for a lot of people. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Prime News. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you did, drop a like. If you didn't like it, hit the dislike button. It's fine. Both are interactions. Uh, if you go down in the comments and, and leave a comment, that'd be great as well. Do, leaving comments, dropping likes, all that stuff actually helps the channel grow. It helps spread the videos. Uh, these Prime News episodes are actually doing decently well on the channel so far. And it's epic, epic three-month return. I said, not a lot of comedy today. It's kind of a, a Friday chill uh, episode. You know, there, there really isn't a lot of, um, oh my gosh, look at this big announcement kind of thing. Uh, not, not, not a lot of energy being expended. I'm chilling, man. It's Friday. It's I, I'm, I'm wearing this sweat jacket. It's 95 plus degrees with 80% plus humidity right now in Wisconsin. I am literally melting under these studio lights. My air conditioner cannot keep up. Things are going nuts right now, but... I suffer these things to try to look good for you. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next video.